If I were to ask you to describe the ideal picture of health and wellness, what would you say? For me, it used to be two young white women, blonde hair and perfect ponytails, which any woman will tell you is an impossible feat, wearing Lululemon pants, smiling at each other, and carrying yoga mats and green juices. This picture is not only an attempt to sell health and wellness, or even the implicit message that we need to be thin, young, fit, and beautiful. The picture also conveys the message that if we don't have these things, then we have no business liking or respecting who we are. It's not only an oversimplified image of health, it's an exclusionary one, a fat phobic, ableist, and elitist one. I say this standing before you as a young, ish, thin, white, middle-class woman. And that privilege is not lost on me. But in my 20s, I too suffered from this ideal image of health and wellness. My food and body image issues were never formally diagnosed. No one, not my family, my friends, or even my doctor had noticed that I had placed my entire self-worth in my appearance because I was the fit, healthy one. But under the surface, I was mentally and physically beating against a current of social messaging that told me if I didn't put myself under the pressure to be thin, eat clean, and white knuckle a workout every single day, that I would have somehow failed, not worthy of love and acceptance. I'm living proof of just a few of the dangers that lie within this single story, this ideal image of health and wellness. This stereotypical and elitist image of wellness must first be recognized for what it is, and then challenged and dismantled. We need to not only broaden our vision of wellness, pass the number on the scale, pass putting that number first and our self-worth last, but to also help to facilitate and educate those in disadvantaged communities to pursue health, that they can pursue health despite obstacles to do so. Camden is experiencing food apartheid. Others would prefer the term food desert. A food desert is a place where people's access to affordable, healthy food is limited due to a lack of nearby supermarkets. In fact, over 34,000 people in the city of Camden alone are experiencing food insecurity. Now, many consider the term food desert to be a misnomer. A desert, after all, is a naturally occurring ecosystem, whereas many believe food deserts are intentionally created through public policy and economic practice. Apartheid is perhaps a more appropriate term as it speaks to systemic discrimination. Now, semantics aside, this isn't just a Camden problem. Last year, 1.3 million people in New Jersey experienced food insecurity. Zoom out even further, and you'll find that this problem affects 19 million Americans. According to World Bank, the number of people experiencing food insecurity globally was estimated to reach a staggering 222 million people in 53 countries and territories at the end of this past year. And as you might expect, the consequences of food insecurity are vast. Physical consequences range from slower healing of wounds to stunted growth to poor eyesight. Perhaps even more unsettling are the mental consequences of malnutrition, like slower brain development, decreased attention span, increased depression, but we knew that malnutrition led to poor health outcomes. So why don't these people just hop in the car and drive to the nearest supermarket? Well, this is where socioeconomics plays in. About 2.3 million Americans live more than 10 miles away from a supermarket and don't own a car. The fact that this happens in places below the poverty line perpetuates the idea that those who are not wealthy can't pursue health, that it's a luxury they can't afford. Now, add on a layer of marginalization. Communities of color experience more food and economic insecurity globally. This again reinforces the idea that those in marginalized communities can't pursue health, or at least the kind splayed on magazine covers and on social media. So what is there to do? While many propose tax incentives for grocery stores to break ground in these areas, most studies are finding that time and money are the biggest issues, not geography. So the big unanswered question becomes, how can people be healthy 
when they don't fit the typical picture of health. And beyond that, beyond the practical strategies of stretching time and money, how can we dismantle this stereotypical image in a way that allows people to feel like they deserve to pursue health? How can we breathe new life into the definition of what it means to pursue health to make it more inclusive? Well, first things first. Let's tackle some of the logistical solutions. Utilizing community gardens to grow your own produce. Visiting local food pantries and soup kitchens. Buying frozen fruits, vegetables, and meats. The latter has a stigma that continues to baffle me. Frozen foods can actually have more vitamins and nutrients. Fresh foods lose these over time, whereas freezing preserves them. But we've become a culture obsessed with fresh foods and clearly not even because they're healthier for us, but because they elicit a certain aesthetic. And because they're more expensive, it creates a subtext about the type of people who get to buy fresh foods versus the type of people who have to buy frozen. But even with all these actionable tips, we still have the biggest issue of all. The second part of the unanswered question, how can we make health and wellness more inclusive? One way is to broaden what we consider healthy food. The past 20 years have seen a push toward organic, non-GMO foods. But from a nutritional standpoint, there's barely a difference. We demonize fast food chains, but many offer healthy options now, like grilled chicken salad and oatmeal with fruit. But still, we moralize the consumption of certain foods over others. The subconscious narrative creates an air of privilege around wellness. You're either in purchasing organic foods, or you're not. You're either part of the health club, or you're not. And membership to this club isn't even just contingent on our food habits. It's what side of the tracks we live on, whether we pay a rent or a mortgage, whether we own a gym membership. This caricature of optimal health has invaded so many facets of our lives. And I fear that we are passively subscribing to this version of health that leaves so many unable to afford the price of admission. The next way to create more inclusive health is to shift our focus for why we should be eating nourishing foods. So many sources out there speak of the obesity epidemic. The narrative has become, we must eat healthy so we don't get fat. This supports the idea that our weight is the most important factor in our health. And that's simply not true. Our body size and shape is determined largely by genetics, a whopping 80%. Therefore, a mere 20% comes down to lifestyle choices, only one of which is diet. So obesity as a result of food choices doesn't reveal the whole picture. What other factors are common among these groups to create poor health outcomes? Could it be, I don't know, increased stress to make ends meet? Poor air quality. The fact that over a quarter of people below the poverty line smoke, double the rate of those above the poverty line. The child from a poor family is seven times less likely to graduate high school. Instead of focusing solely on food in relation to health, we need to broaden what constitutes healthy behavior. Health includes factors like exercise. Sure, yoga and spin classes are fun, but they're also expensive. Can you find exercise equipment on Craigslist? Or do body weight exercises in your home? Can you use the stairs at work? Health also includes self-care. Massages and facials are luxurious, but you know what else can fill your cup? TV. When you're watching TV with someone, you are relaxing, laughing, connecting. These are essential for our mental health. But still, even for others, these strategies fall short. If we examine these tactics on a global scale, we have people who don't have freezers, or Facebook, or Netflix. What about them? This likely requires a more broad discussion of solutions, like education, empowerment, and the strengthening of our grassroots organizations. But it also starts with us here in this room, those who have the resources to access health and wellness. It's getting involved with organizations that provide global food assistance. It's communicating the importance of farmers markets to your local legislators. It's being mindful of how we purchase and use the foods we buy to minimize waste. But we can't use any of these strategies in any meaningful way 
If we don't learn to smudge our black and white thinking to create a gray area in which all can participate. Healthism conveys the idea that our health is not only completely in our control, but somehow a moral imperative. Healthism makes those that don't fit social media's version of health feel like failures. When we label foods as good and bad, and the bad foods are the only ones accessible to certain people, we are implicitly labeling these people bad, labeling them moral failures. This creates feelings of unworthiness that do nothing to turn a tide that has become generational. It only continues to turn a cogwheel of oppression and marginalization that still exists today. <laughs> if we want to talk moral responsibility, we have the responsibility to recreate a version of health that is not moralized and elitist, but is multifaceted, flexible, and inclusive for all. This conversation is not enough to address the multi-systemic issues that have contributed to the inequities that we see in who gets to experience health and wellness. It's not enough to address the nuances not only of the problems, but of the solutions. But it is enough to implore us to consider our privilege. We have the resources to access health and wellness, but it is also our privilege to dethrone our idealized vision of health and wellness to be agents of change, to shatter the stigma, to help make health and wellness accessible to all, and to reaffirm to those who have been marginalized that they belong to the club not only of health, but of humanity. Thank you.